freedom sings in your heart. It's such a beautiful sound, such a beautiful sound. He loves to hear his children sing.
church we've been birthed out of so many prophetic words and dreams and the we heart of are on a mission we are not a casual we just happen to all be so many of us have stories of how god has moved heaven and earth to get us all in this place and link us together we are and we pray for you daily we are believing for breakthrough in your family we are a community of people who've been called by God to impact Los Angeles and the world. We are called as a community here at Expression to put Jesus on display. That there would be a people in LA who would love His presence and believe for the impossible. We're a community that seeks wholeheartedly after truth. And we, Expression, we are on a mission together to see Jesus invade our city, to see Jesus invade industries of the world, to see justice bring restoration. Lift up our heads, lift up our praise, drop on
Expression 58 family, we are going to take this moment and together we're going to take communion. So if you can go and grab a piece of bread and some wine or some grape juice or something that you can, uh, so you can join us, we want to do, do this together. Celebrating Easter, remembering the goodness of God. And as you do that, I, I've, been, I've been praying and thinking a lot about Nehemiah as we've been studying that book. You know, in chapter 9, we see the response of a people who were broken, a people who rebelled, a people who were oppressed. And as, as God set them free, they, they just came to this point where they realized just how incredibly compassionate God is. And that there's nothing else who can make them whole. That only God can save them. Only God can restore them. Only God can heal them. Chapter 9, verse 17. It says, but you are a forgiving God. Gracious and compassionate. Slow to anger and abundant in love. And I pray today as we take communion that there will be a revelation of just the covenant of God over your life. That God died for you. Jesus gave his life to restore you. That he never gave up. He never gave up on us. But, but he was willing to go all the way to the cross for the joy set before him. For you and me. So let's take the bread as we remember the sacrifice, how his body was broken for you and me. God, we thank you for giving yourself for us, even when we many times, God, were lost in unbelief and fear and other things. God, you never gave up. So today, God, we come and we celebrate you. We take this bread in remembrance of you. Will you take the bread with me? And Jesus, you, you bled for us. And today, as we take this, this juice, we, we remember, God, the power of your blood. God, thank you that we are cleansed, that we are purified, that we are sanctified by your blood. God, we know that there is power in your blood. And I pray that as we take this together, that healing will take place in our, in our lives, God, in our minds, in our hearts. God, you know the things that are broken inside of us. You know the problems that we have, God, and, and your blood can restore everything. So today, we take this, God, understanding the power that is in your blood. Will you take the juice with me? bring 
Welcome everybody. Uh, worship team, thank you so much. That was so good. And I just wanna welcome everybody that's watching online. We're so grateful you're here with us today. Uh, happy Easter. What an amazing day that we get to celebrate today. Uh, everything that God has done for, for us, his incredible love for us. And uh, we're so excited you're here with us today. Uh, my name is Hona Toledo. I'm the lead pastor with my wife, Jennifer. Uh, that you're going to hear from her later. Um, we just want to welcome you and we're going to have a, an amazing service today. Uh, as we transition into our offering, uh, I'm going to tell you some of the ways that you can give. The first one, you can text A58 uh, to 77977. You can also uh, go to our website at expression58.org slash giving. Um, or you can use the app. We have an Expression 58 app that you can also use for giving. Um, you know, as, as we talk about giving, uh, I last week I talked about Nehemiah chapter 8. Uh, we finished a series, and if you didn't get to listen to it, I really recommend you, you go back and listen to that. It's an incredible series. And in verse verse 10, there's there's a moment when it, 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 sh it talks about the importance of generosity and how we actually find joy in generosity. And as Expression 58, we are committed to be a, a, a community of generosity and there's so many things that we know that are in the heart of God. And together we get to build those things. And so this is a time for, for us to come before God and show Him our gratitude for all the good things that He's given us. Um, so I'm going to pray for the offering. Father, I thank you for this offering. I thank you for every person that is uh, given today. God, thank you for all the purposes and the things that we are uh, we get to build together. And I pray they will bless every family as they give uh, this morning. 
Uh, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you some of the some of the things that are, are happening here. At Expression 58. We are back. We are starting live services. So um, we have uh, starting April April 11. Uh, we are going to be meeting at the YWIM base in Silmar. Uh, it's by the 210. It's an incredible space uh, and there's bathroom, there's parking. We are so excited that we're going to be there every morning at 10 a.m. for the spring. And also uh, for everybody who can, it's too far or I can only do online at, at the moment, we're going to continue our online services at 1130. So we are not stopping that. We want to make sure that uh, we are, are blessing our online community in this season. So we're putting a lot of effort into that. Expression 58 family, we are so happy that we can be uh, together uh, in person. You know, for the ones who can come, uh, we miss you. And for the ones that we will just see online, we'll continue to, to check with you guys. And uh, it, this is going to be an amazing season. And we are excited for all the things that God has in store for us. Well, now I get to introduce uh, to you my beautiful wife and she has prepared an incredible message uh, this this morning good morning and happy easter we are so grateful to have you with us from wherever you're tuning in from um, it is such a joy to get to celebrate uh, resurrection sunday with you thank you so much for joining us today um, worship was incredible. I just pray that you just get ministered to and encouraged today. Um, so as we're celebrating Easter here at Expression, I want to just kind of kick us off this morning with a little story. Now, this took place, um, gosh, like 2002, 2003. So quite a long time ago, I was a young single woman. Um, if you know a little bit of my history, I was living in Africa for a few years, um, doing a lot of just missions work and, and justice work, and I had this incredible invitation. And the invitation actually came from um, southern Sudan, where this is before the north and the south split into two separate countries. At the time, there was still one country, and there was active uh, civil war kind of a, uh, it really was the North trying to annihilate the Christian South. So it was very, you know, a horrific environment and circumstance. And, um, and so the South, which was predominantly Christian, were being wiped out by the predominantly Muslim North. And the, the leaders of the rebel army um, had heard about what was going on with kids. And so they invited me, if I would come in with a team and bring the God to a whole generation of kids in the South who had never heard the gospel. And the sad part was many of those kids, their parents had been martyred for their faith. And yet you have a whole generation now of, of orphans, of children living in dire circumstances in war, and um, they don't even know the faith in which their parents died for. And so you can imagine there's just so much trauma and heartache around it, but um, I knew that the Lord was saying, yes, go. And so um, we went in with a team and so much went on, but I want to just kind of hone in on a few parts of what happened during our time there. During the days, every day we would go out and um, there'd be groups of kids that were kind of gathered around, you know, a thousand kids, 1,500 kids every day in different areas throughout the region. And we would come and we would bring them food and love on them and share the gospel. And we're watching God do crazy miracles. And it, during the day, it was always awesome. But every night we would come back and every night they would gather all the youth, all the high school, middle school, teenagers. And, you know, we were kind of expecting the same thing of what was happening during the day to happen at night. And every night it was so hard. You know, we're sharing the gospel and these kids are just sitting there wide eyed, but wouldn't say yes to Jesus. And there was so much fear in their eyes. And the more I just learned and listened, I realized these kids had witnessed horrendous things happening to every Christian they knew. And they knew that to say yes to Christianity would put a mark on their life. And um, so every night was really, really hard. And we were doing this night after night after night, and I was weary. And I was like, God, you love these kids. God, I pray that you would just give them hope, that you would heal their hearts. And I'm just praying that their hearts would open up to God because I knew that God was the only one who could deal with their trauma, was the only one who could, who could comfort them, who could be present with them, right? And, and so I was just in anguish for these kids, these teens. And after... I think it was six nights maybe at this point, and we're not getting anywhere. And I was so desperate. And um, I was going in, you know, to, to, to preach once again. And I, I remember praying and saying, God, I, 
I need like a visualization of what it means to be a new creation. That's really what I felt like the Lord was talking about was wanting them to understand the power of what it is to be made new in Christ. And I kept thinking, you know, the, the best way to explain that that I could think of was like a butterfly, right? Like a butterfly kind of just starts as this caterpillar, not very awesome. It's kind of stuck to the ground and very limited and it gets stepped on. And then it goes through this beautiful transformation process and comes out majestic and free and able to fly and soar and go to new heights it could never go to before. And, and it's, just, it's just so incredible, right? And, and so I you know, begin to think about this is what God does in our lives, right? When we say yes to Christ, he takes our pain, he takes our limitation, and we're truly invited to live in a completely new reality. We are transformed. And so I was thinking, man, I wish I had a butterfly. And, uh, you know, as, as it would be there, you know, it was pouring rain. Um, if you've ever been a, in a tropical climate, I mean, it's, it was pouring tropical climate kind of rain, um, just sheets of rain coming down. And I was like, I'm pretty sure butterflies don't fly in the rain. Uh, so there went my, you know, my visual analogy I was going to use. Um, went to the service anyway. And as I, I get into the service, and I'm just praying. And I'm like, God, break in, break in. And I get up, and it's my time to preach. And I get up, you know, at, stand at the podium, and I open up my Bible. And I remember this so distinctly. I had my, my Grandma Ruby. Uh, it was her Bible, and I had it with me. And I opened up my Grandma Ruby Bible. Grandma uh, Ruby's Bible, and I placed it on um, the podium, and I opened up my Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and I'm going to read it to you, but it says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And as I read this scripture, I opened up my Bible to that scripture, put it down. In this very moment, this was one of the most incredible things I got to witness in, witness in my whole life. But from the back of the room, in the door, in the pouring rain, it is now pitch black and pouring rain, a butterfly, and I am not exaggerating, the size of both of my hands together, comes flying in the room. And everybody's looking up like, what, what? I mean, it was so huge and majestic. I mean, it was pearly white with all these colors on it. And, um, and it, it comes, it flies in the room. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like we're gonna have church, right? I'm like, what? This is so crazy. And it flies in and I, I'm telling you the truth. It lands right on my Bible, right on 2 Corinthians 5, 17. And it just sits there. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is a sign and a wonder. God, these kids, like you're coming for them. You want them to know that you can transform their life. You know, and I was just like so moved. I'm weeping and I'm just, I'm like, let's go, let's go, right? So I just began to just go after it. And I'm like, this is what God wants to do in your life. And I, I just began to preach the gospel to these kids. And we're going for it. Now, you know, if you've ever been to church, sometimes in other countries, you know, Africa being one of them, Latin America being one of them, but, you know, a lot of different countries. I mean, when you have in church, you have church for a long time. So um, I was allotted three hours to preach. And this butterfly does not move off of my Bible. And I begin to move around the room with the butterfly and my Bible showing the kids and they're just weeping. And I'm like, this is what God wants to do in your life. God wants to give you a new start. God is the only one who can heal you. He can transform the pain, bring it to God. And I'm just walking around the room and these kids are getting rocked. And after three hours, this thing has not moved off of my Bible. And at the end of the night, I do this opportunity to say yes to Jesus. And, and I'm, I'm like, okay, I have been fast. I was you know, fasting and praying for this. I've been in, you know, just pressing in all these nights, and I'm expecting here we're gonna see the breakthrough. And then you know what? We didn't. <laughs> we didn't see the breakthrough that night. Um, I sat there in shock as I give this opportunity, and these kids just sit there with tears streaming down their face, but they do not respond to the Lord. And I'm like, okay. And I just was like, just praying for them and just blessing them, and I leave for the night. And I go back into my room. And th that was one of the longest nights of my life. I mean, I wept all night. I cried out to God 
all night. I was praying for these kids. I, I can't even, I couldn't even begin to understand the depth of their pain and their fear, right? And so just crying out, because remember, this is, there wasn't a lot of physical things we could do to help them. There was still active war. So I had been snuck in by the rebel army. There weren't NGOs there. There wasn't access to food sources. I mean, this was very, very, very hard. And I was like, God, they need you. You're the only one that can break into this madness. And uh, cried out all night long. And it was a long and a hard night. And then very, very, very early in the morning, just as dawn was beginning to break, I hear a knock on my door. And it's, it's still pouring rain. I hear a knock on my door. And I go and I open up my door. It's this little hut, you know, uh, makeshift hut door. And um, there's a boy, 15-year-old boy by the name of Juma. And he's standing there. And I found out later that those kids never left that building all night, that they sat there all night and just under the presence of God, just getting, just contemplating what it would cost them. And Juma comes, finds my hut, knocks at my door right at dawn, and he's weeping. And he says, I cannot wait another moment. I am ready to die for Jesus Christ. I am ready to give my life to him. And I just collapse onto the ground with him, and we just begin to weep, and we're in the rain, and it's, you know, it's, it's this beautiful moment at dawn, and I just get to lead this incredible young man to the Lord. And I just thought, man, if I came all the way here just for Juma, it was worth it. And then a series of things begin to happen very, very quickly from that moment. Um, I'm not going to go into great detail, but shortly after Juma left, there was another knock on the door, and um, I was give, given word that, that one of the girls in the girls' dorm, there was about 150 girls crammed into a dorm, um, was possessed by a demon. Um, I don't know who's all watching this and the little ears in the room, but this, this girl was not having, just having a bad day. I mean, she was possessed, possessed, all right? And it was crazy. And um, so right after Juma left, we got to go and minister deliverance to this girl. And, and 150 girls are pinned up against the wall watching this poor girl um, just be really tortured, you know, under this, uh, under this spirit. And uh, she gets set free. And all these kids watch this, right? This is, this is so incredible because from that day, from that moment, Juma and the, the girl Betty who got set free, they team up. And within 24 hours, they had led all of those youth to the Lord. And miracles were happening. I mean, it was in, what, what went on from there was so crazy. There was a breakout of the Holy Spirit in that place. Those kids in the middle of active war saw angels surrounding them, um, pr supernatural provision of food, like crazy things began to break out in their lives. And I think about this story often for a lot of reasons. Um, but one, you know, I think about the reality that is that for many of us, we've experienced maybe a long, hard night, a season of feeling like I can't get breakthrough, a season of feeling like life, I just, I'm constantly disappointed. It's hard. I'm not getting anywhere. Are my prayers getting off the ground? And we know what it means to have a long, hard night. But then, and this is the promise that we have in Christ. This is the, what Easter reminds us is that Jesus has come to dawn a new day in your life. And one encounter with Jesus changes everything, changes everything. I love this passage. If anybody's in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. Easter reminds us that Jesus can take all the old, all the hard, and transform it into something beautiful, into something incredible. He takes our pain and transforms it into beauty. And so this morning, we're going to take some time, uh, and we're going to talk about the dawn of a new day. The dawn of a new day. Here's the reality. Victory begins in the dark. You know, in Genesis, um, the evening and the morning were the first day. Have you noticed that? It says that God established the evening and the morning. He actually put dark before light. You would think when God is establishing day, he would begin with light. But he doesn't. He begins with dark, dark before light. And so actually the day begins in the dark. You know, you think about the clock. 
right? In the evening, it's dark. At night, it's dark. But the second the clock hits midnight, it becomes morning. Now, it still looks the same. It's still dark. There's nothing has shifted, but it's actually the beginning of a new day. And I'd like to encourage you today to remind you that we don't base things off of how they look or our circumstances, but rather what we know by faith to be true. And I want to declare over you, today is a new day. Today is a new day. It might still be dark, but it's the dawn of a new day. Psalms 56 verse 9 says, The very day I call for help, the tide of battle turns. My enemies flee. This one thing I know, God is for me. I love this. The moment I cried out for help, my circumstances hadn't changed. It all still looked the same. The war was still raging, but the moment I connected to God, the moment I said yes, the moment I turned my attention to him, the moment I engaged my faith, the tide of the battle changed. The tide of the battle changed. You see, the tide of the battle changes when we engage with Christ. The tide of the battle in our lives changes when we engage our faith. I know that God is for me. And I know many of us can understand this season, right, where it seems like um, maybe it's been a long and a hard area or season in your life, but I want to encourage you that light is on the way. You know, when you think about the Easter story, um, you know, in the days and weeks that led up to to Friday, to the day where Jesus was crucified, um, you look at the life and the ministry of Jesus and how he radically shaped the world, right? You look at the miracles and the hope and the healing and the comfort and the inclusion and, and just changed everything. Jesus's life changed everything. And, um, and then you have all of this breakthrough and victory and, and glory. You've never felt, you know, these, the, imagine the disciples, they've never felt more seen and loved and, and they're living in this incredible God, you know, moment in history. And then all of a sudden Friday comes and um, Jesus is betrayed and he's arrested and he's tortured And this isn't just their friend, although it is their friend. This is the Messiah. This is the Son of God. This was this is not supposed to happen. That it feels like the devil's winning. This feels impossible that this could be God. I don't know about you, but I've had many times in my life where I'm like, this is impossible that God could fix this or use this. This just feels like hell is running rampant, right? And I'm sure that's exactly how it felt to them as they're watching the Savior of the world. Be crucified, the most perfect human who never sinned, take the sin of the world on himself, be, be tortured and be, be treated like the worst of prisoners. I'm sure as they heard Jesus yell out from the cross, it is finished, tetelestai, I'm sure as they heard those words, they're thinking their dreams are finished, right? I'm sure they were thinking the hope is finished, God moving in my life is finished. It's all over. The devil won. I'm sure that's how it looked in their perspective. The crucifixion made no sense to them. You know, the world felt out of control. The bad guys had won. Darkness had won. You know, I I can't think of something more terrible. I can't think of an experience more awful, more traumatic. How do you recover from that? How could it happen that the Son of Man could die? How could mere humans torture God's Son? Was this truly the end of all that was good, everything we'd hoped for? You know, it was this moment, Friday, the crucifixion was devastating to his followers. It was crushing. It was the worst thing they could ever imagine, their worst nightmare. You know, and some of you know what it's like to live through your worst nightmare, your worst fear, things you never could have imagined that you could endure. Some of you understand what that's like. And you know, when we read the story, we, we get to look at it, you know, 
We know what's coming. We know the coming chapters. But when you're walking through this in your own life, you don't know what's coming. You only know the present, right? And, he, and I think this is what's so powerful and where we get to learn and we get tools for walking through the present in our own life. Even if we don't know what's coming in the next chapter, God does. God's been to your future. He's good. He will be good. So after Friday, which is this horrific day in history, heartbreaking, heart-wrenching day in history, comes Saturday. And you know, Saturday was the Sabbath, and there was absolutely nothing the followers of Jesus could do about their pain, about the situation, the injustice. There was, they were literally forced to just stay home. You couldn't move about on the Sabbath. They were forced to sit in their unanswered questions. They were forced to sit in their disappointment, in their grief. They literally could do nothing. I don't know about you, but I have found myself so many times in my life wanting to fast forward the Saturday seasons of my life. You know those seasons where, you know, the door of what was is now closed, but you don't know what's next, and you're just stuck in the unknown. You're stuck in the, the limbo and the questions and the disappointment and the, the frustration and all the unanswered questions, and you're just stuck there. I so often want to rush that process, but the Easter story reminds me God is present in all of it. God is present in all of it. Um... When we're forced to sit in the unknown, those spaces we can't control, the vulnerable, the fragile space of grieving, that's where we begin to truly exercise faith and believe that our God is the only one who could make something good out of the mess we've been through. I have been trying to train myself when I find myself in a Saturday season instead of just falling into despair, to truly engage my faith. Because here's reality, right? When we're in heaven, we're gonna see Jesus face to face. To faith. There's not gonna be the same level of faith. Like the only, the gift of faith that I can give to him is so unique on the side of eternity. Because when we see him, it's not gonna require faith because you've seen him, right? But when you are in the struggle and you can, you can trust him and you can worship even when you don't see the answer, that is such a rich and a beautiful gift that we can give the Lord. And I want to encourage you, Saturdays are uncomfortable. Those Saturday seasons are uncomfortable, but they are a set up. They are a set up from God. So don't despise your Saturday season. And this is also really important to remember. God's silence does not mean his absence. God's silence does not mean his absence. Do you remember the story of, of Martha and Mary? Two sisters who sent a message to Jesus about their brother Lazarus, who was very sick. Uh, and they told him, Jesus, come quickly. Our brother is very sick. And Jesus didn't do what they expected him to do, right? They expected him to he come and heal him. And Jesus didn't do it. Um, but... His silence was not an indicator of his absence. It's a Saturday season. So when Jesus did come, if you remember the story, um, and Lazarus, their brother, had already died, Martha goes out to Jesus and she says, had you been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Right? How often we get stuck on you know, this kind of concept, like what I thought God was going to do, how I thought that prophecy would play out, how I expected my marriage to be, my kids to be, how I thought this was going to look when I obeyed you. God, this is really different, right? It's all of our expectation. And I don't know if you've noticed, <laughs> noticed yet, um, I don't particularly see God catering to our expectations. At least he doesn't to mine, Right. And I think so often we get so caught up in our own expectation of how we want God to move, of how we expect him to move. And God's just, God isn't moved by that because he's God. He's going to do it however he wants. And many times the second you get stuck on something, he's like, so now I actually have to do it completely different because I'm not going to let that be an idol in your life, right? Our hope is in him. It is not in an outcome. And I've watched this you know, especially in this nation in this past season, I've watched so many people put their hope in an outcome, not in who God is. Our hope cannot be in outcomes. Our hope must be 
in him, right? And so when we get kind of caught up in these Saturday seasons, like Martha and Mary were, um, sitting in our broken disappointments, our bruised expectations, um, sometimes those broken expectations can turn into resentment. Sometimes they can turn into regret. I should have, I wish I would have. And we can just start spiraling in that. Have you ever been there? You know, some of us can get stuck in the past. You know, where we kind of wrongly placed expectations um, in the, or in the future, you know. And so the reality is that God wants to break into our present right here, right where you are. Whether you're in a Saturday season, he wants to break in right here. Even if it's still dark, he's still with you. He still is. He's still present. He's still good. He has not changed. You know, this past year, um, as a church, we studied the seven I am statements of Jesus. And um, this story, actually, that I'm talking about, Martha and Mary, is where we hear Jesus make his final I am statement. Uh, Jesus just looks in this moment right into Martha's soul, right into her Saturday, right into her disappointment and heartache and frustration and broken expectations and her grief. He looks right into that and he draws her close and he says, Martha, I am the resurrection. I am the resurrection. It's who he is. It's his nature. Notice he doesn't say, Martha, I do resurrections. Like, I can do it. He says, it's who I am. I cannot help, Martha. But it's, it's by my very nature. I take dead places and bring them alive. I take pain and turn them into something beautiful. I take dark nights and turn it into the dawn of a new day. It's who I am. I can't escape it. I can't not be that. It's who I am. I am the God of resurrection. It's who I am. I am the God who brings new life. I am the God who takes the butterfly and turns it into a, or, sorry, the caterpillar and turns it into a butterfly, right? I am the God who can take your pain, your mess, your dysfunction, your heartache, I, and, and transform it. That's just who I am. It's who I am. He tells her, I am the resurrection. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. The story is not over until he says so, right? He's the God of second chances, the one who turns painful things into beautiful things. John eleven twenty five 25, and 26, this is what he said to her. I am the resurrection and I am life eternal. Anyone who clings to me in faith, even though he dies, will live forever. And the one who lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? This is the question Jesus asks us in our Saturday seasons. Do you believe this? I know you can't see it. I know it's hard. I know it's dark. I am the resurrection. Are you, do you expect a resurrection? Do you believe that I can take this mess and turn it into something beautiful? I can take your heartache. I can take you know, the disappointment and make this something glorious. Do you believe? And then what he says to her right after is very interesting. He says, take me to the place where you laid him. Jesus says, will you take me to the place? Will you let me into the place where you laid your broken dreams, where you laid your heart, where you laid your disappointment? Will you take me to the place of pain in your life? Will you let me in? Will you let me into the grief? Will you let me in to the frustration? Will you let me in? And they take him there. They let him in. And scripture tells us that when Jesus got there, he so beautifully enters that space with them. And he sits and he weeps with them that he was deeply overwhelmed with emotion and grief. And he cries out passionately with them. He sat with them in their most tender, vulnerable pain. Jesus doesn't sweep it under the rug. He doesn't tell them, get over it. Come on, remember, I'm good. Like, he doesn't doesn't dismiss it. He doesn't minimize it. He sits in the pain with them, and Jesus weeps. 
He sits in the abuse. He sits in the heartache. He sits in the neglect. Whatever it is, he sits in the rejection. He sits in that place and he grieves with you. And he feels with you. And he weeps with you. And it's this beautiful moment of Jesus engaging with his creation. His heart breaks for what breaks your heart. Yes, he knows the end of the story. Yes, he knows that, that he's going to redeem it all. He knows that, but he's still fully God, fully human. Like, he sits and he feels with us. He's so tender and so present. And as Jesus weeps in their brokenness with them, John eleven forty three 43 says, Then with a loud voice, Jesus shouted with authority, Lazarus, come out of the tomb. Jesus declares, come out of the tomb, rise up, rise up. Jesus begins to just unleash his power, his goodness, his resurrection power in this moment. And suddenly for Martha and for Mary, it was the dawn of a new day. Suddenly everything shifted. Suddenly what was their obstacle now becomes their point of victory. If you're not familiar with the story, Lazarus came back to life. The unthinkable, the shocking. They expected Jesus to heal him. They never expected a resurrection. Let me tell you, whatever God has planned for you is always better than what you're expecting. You know, what's interesting about this is that the disciples were with Jesus um, that day when Lazarus was raised. They watched that whole thing go down. They heard Jesus say, I am the resurrection. They watched this. Um, they watched him do the impossible. But when they themselves on this Easter weekend, right, when they themselves were in their dark Saturday, it was hard to remember. It was hard to, to grapple with that. Maybe you can relate with that. Maybe you have faith for God to come through for other people, but you struggle to have faith that God will come through for you. Maybe you know God's good for others, but you question, is he really good for me? They found themselves wrestling with the same questions that Easter weekend that, that they watched Martha and Mary wrestle with. Jesus, what happened? Why is this happening, right? You know, the Easter story puts all of those questions that we have to rest once and for all. At the center of our Christian faith is this radical paradox. The most horrible thing that ever happened was the most wonderful thing that ever happened. I want to read to you a poem by uh, Paul Tripp. He says, In your weakest, most vulnerable, seemingly helpless, public shame moment, Hanging on a rough-hued cross between heaven and hail. Nailed, bleeding, thirsty, life ebbing out of you. Victim, mocked and scorned. You are a conquering king. Not defeated, the victor. Seemingly defeated, you conquered sin, Satan, death. Put to shame, you were putting to shame all who would shame you. Not cowering in fear, you were parading your sovereign glory, unleashing your transforming grace, expediting your redemptive plan. The darkest moment ever became the brightest moment ever. The greatest defeat became the greatest victory. The moment of death was a triumph of life. You were where you came to be, doing what you came to do. You did not surrender for a moment so that we could stand firm for a lifetime. You did not give in to defeat so that we would experience victory. Everything you suffered was for us. Every battle fought was for us. Every victory won was won for us. In your moment of apparent defeat, you became forever our victor. I love this. We need to be careful how we make sense um, of our lives, right? What looks like disaster 
may in fact be an invitation to the wildest grace you've ever experienced. What looks like the end may in fact be the beginning. What looks like, you know, hopeless to you may in fact be an instrument for for promotion in your life. God is a good father. He is resurrection. He is the dawn of a new day. It's who he is. You know, the same God who allowed Friday is the same God who sits with us in the long Saturday. And the same God who says over your life, I am the resurrection. Do you believe? Do you believe? It's the same God who's, who's shouting over your life, over your family, over your career, over your marriage, over you know you, all that you're doing. Lazarus, come forth. Every dead place come to life. He is the God who does that, who does the impossible. He takes the disasters of our lives and turns them into these glorious jewels of redemption. He takes our failures and transforms them into grace, right? Our pain into deep wells of strength. Like, just think about that butterfly. He is the God who transforms. He is the God who turns dark to light. It's who he is. He suffered so that we could have life. He conquered sin so that we could go free. So Saturdays, although are hard and they're uncomfortable, those seasons of not knowing, those seasons of not understanding, those seasons that seem quiet, I want to remind you, God doesn't change his nature on Saturday. Just because it's dark, it's always the darkest right before the dawn, just because it's dark doesn't mean that our powerful, redeeming God is not near or that he's somehow fallen off the throne in your life. He is ever-present. And as you know, then comes Sunday. Every one of the gospel story t- uh, stories tells that the first visitors to the tomb came very early at dawn. Early the next morning, why it was still dark. You know, that day began in darkness. It began, as you could imagine, I'm sure, just with all of the, the grief and the doubt and the frustration, just kind of this pour over of the night before. I'm sure today is going to be just as awful as yesterday, right? That was just probably how the disciples were feeling in that moment. Um, feeling they're always getting their hopes up and getting disappointed, right? And um, the women got up early. Their hearts were heavy. Their minds clouded with grief and disappointment. The smile of their friend, the compassion of his words, the light that had emanated from his eyes, it felt like it had all been extinguished. But the dawn signifies that darkness has no hold, no grip, no authority over the world. And as daybreak was just breaking out, the women um, are heading to the tomb, and Mark 16 tells us, When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb when they asked each other, who will roll away the stone from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, um, sitting on the, on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You're looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. When Jesus rose... Uh, When Jesus rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had driven seven demons. I love I love all the gospel encounter, uh, you know, stories of this, how they narrate it. Um, I love what happens here in in Mark, um, how Mark tells it. 
Um, <clears throat> it says that they're heading, now you have to remember right before Mark 16, the last verse in, in, in Mark 15, uh, verse 47 says, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph saw where he was laid. So they had watched. They'd seen where Jesus' body was put. They'd watched this huge stone, you know, rolled in front of it. And they're I don't know what they're thinking, right? They're taking this stuff to anoint his body, but they're like, how are we even, we're just trying to do something, but we don't even know, like, are we going to convince soldiers to move that stone? Like, how are we even going to move that stone, right? They're thinking about the stone being in the way of just trying to, you know, them try to um, minister to Jesus's body, if you will, right? And so something you need to keep in mind is that stone, you know, archaeologists, uh, archaeologists believe that it was somewhere between two to 4,000 pounds of stone. And so it, it was not like these women could have moved this stone, right? This was, this was a whole operation to get, you know, to move a, a stone of this nature. So when they get there, the same stone that they had seen on Friday, right? The same stone that had been rolled in front of the grave, the same stone that, that declared to them it was over, was now the first sign to them that victory was happening. It was the first miracle. It, actually, the thing that was blockading uh, and, and stopping what they felt was God, right? The, the problem in their life was now prophesying to them. It was the first thing. It was the first thing they saw. The stone was rolled away. The problem now became the prophet telling them, Jesus is on the move, right? I wonder how many things we've looked at and we've lost sleep over the problem, the block, the thing in our way. And we don't even realize how, how easy it is for God to make that very thing prophesy to you and just in a moment move it. I love that. All of a sudden, at dawn of the third day, everything changed, right? Jesus was alive. And this meant, this changed everything. This meant Jesus was who he said he was. This meant Jesus was truly God's son. This had never been seen before, right? This was incredible. They are watching Jesus conquer death and sin. Everything Jesus had said was true. The veil at the temple was torn. Now everybody had access to God. This was the absolute game changer for all of history. This moment you know, if you think about it too, you know, everything in human history, all the, all the, prophet, you know, the prophets and the priests and everything that had gone on before all pointed for this moment that God was going to do this. For thousands of years, people have been saying, God's going to send a Messiah. This is what's going to happen. Everything points to this moment. And then from this moment forward in history, everything that ever happens would be in reference to this moment. Literally, time is split in two in this moment when Jesus raises from the dead. B.C. and A.D., before Christ, Anno Domini, the year of our Lord, everything shifts. Everything in all of the universe is now centered in relation to this moment. And I'm not going to go into the historical aspects of this. Um, there is no question historically whether you believe in Jesus or not if Jesus lived. There is no question historically whether you believe in Jesus or not that the tomb was empty three days later. There's no question about that because even his enemies agreed with that. This was a powerful moment. Jesus was alive. And if you know the story, he begins to, to just appear and, and people begin to see him and engage with him and eat with him and hug him and touch him, right? A new day had dawned. Jesus is resurrection. He cannot help but bring life where there's, where there's death. It was a new day for his friends. It was a new day for his enemies. It was a new day for sinners. It was a new day for the poor. It was a new day for the lost. It was a new day for the hungry. It was a new day for the hurting. It was a new day for the outcasts. It was a new day for women. It was a new day for everybody. Jesus brings new. Jesus changes the story. Jesus flips the script. Jesus transforms. It's who he is. This was the most incredible day in all of human history. I believe saints of old, right, just celebrating everything that they'd given themselves for. This was God's great redemption plan. It was a new day for them. It was a new day for all of creation. 
Now everybody could have hope. Everybody could have eternal life. Everybody could have healing and a solution. Everybody could have forgiveness. We didn't have to hustle for our worthiness. We didn't have to try to earn God's love. We didn't have to try to you know, live right enough and offer enough sacrifices. Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice. Jesus paid the ultimate price. Jesus offered everybody a new day. Luke 1, says, a new day will dawn on us from above because our God is loving and merciful. He will give light to those who live in the dark and in death's shadow. He will guide us into the way of peace. This is who Jesus is. I think back to that butterfly, right? If anybody's in Christ, if anybody calls out to him, if anybody receives him, We have this invitation to live in a new day, not just the bleed over of yesterday. I mean, truly a new life, a new creation, a new hope. We no longer are limited to the things of this world. We have access to supernatural creativity. We have access to supernatural hope. We have access to to healing. We have, with God, all of a sudden you're not bound to what every other human is bound to. You have access to the king of the universe. Resurrection himself comes and resides within you and transforms you. One moment, one moment with Jesus changes everything. One moment of inviting him into the pain or the disappointment can change everything. Church, it is time that we begin to expect a new day. Expect a resurrection. It is the dawn of a new day. We need to declare this over our lives. We need to shake off the sleepiness of Saturday seasons and begin to come into alignment with the fact that God is on the move. God is moving. And I want to just encourage you with this as we just wrap up. Don't look back to how God moved last time. Because right? sometimes the greatest barrier to what God is doing is what, what he used to do or how he did it last time. I love that, you know, the pastor says, don't, you know, forget not his faithfulness. But maybe we should forget the form in which it came. Because sometimes we can get addicted to a certain form of seeing God move, a certain way of how he breaks in. Once again, having our hope in him, not in a certain set of expectations. God is doing something new. I believe that I'm going to see a resurrection in this nation, in this city, in this church, in my life. I believe we're we're in being invited into the dawn of a new day. I don't know what it's going to look like, but I trust him and I know him. It's not my job to predict how the new day is going to look. I don't need to know how as long as I know who, right? God is saying he's doing a new thing. He's still faithful. Uh, It's going to be different than we expected, but he has already been to your future. And friend, I'm telling you, he has good, good things for you. The story is not over. I love in this story that the first person, Jesus, the risen Christ, reveals himself to is Mary of Magdalene. I love that. The one who had been through the most pain the one who had experienced the most rejection. It's almost as though she, you know, I wonder, did she just accept his death? Like she under, she understood pain. Did she just accept somehow this must have been God's plan? Because you don't see the others rushing to the tomb. You don't see, you know, the disciples didn't, didn't accept his death. They were, you know, deep in their own questioning and they didn't want Jesus to die, obviously, but um, you see them wrestling. I wonder if she was the first to embrace the resurrection because she was the first or maybe she was okay, not okay, but you know what I'm saying, like she, she surrendered to whatever God was doing. What do we need to accept in this season? Maybe it's some uncertainty, just we need to accept it. Maybe it's change. You see, when you embrace Friday, you get to experience Sunday. I think unmet expectation in many times is the starting point of a resurrection. Let go. 
Let go of what you thought your life was supposed to look like. Let go of what you expected your career to be like or the timeline of your life. Let go and begin to come and worship him. Trust him. Love him. It's the dawn of a new day. Release is the first step of resurrection. Because our God is rolling stones. Let me tell you, he is rolling stones. I've heard your stories. I know it's true. I've seen it in my own life. Our God rolls impossible stones. I want to just end with the verse, uh, the, the, the words Jesus said to, to Martha. He said in John 11, I am the resurrection and I am life eternal. Anyone who clings to me in faith, even though he dies, will live forever. And the one who lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? And I don't know who's watching today. I don't know where you are in your life. I don't know what's going on, but I know this. Jesus is the same for every single one of us. It doesn't matter what your history is. It doesn't matter how far maybe you feel from God. I want you to hear my words today. Jesus is good and he loves you. He loves you. He is deeply invested in your life. He knows the, those you know, graveyards of pain. And I wanna encourage you, let him in. Take him to where it's laid, let him in. He's the only one. He won't judge you. He's not going to judge your sin and your mess and your, you know, dysfunction. He is saying, let me in. I want to heal you. I want to restore you. I want to transform you into this butterfly. I, I want to dawn a new day in your life. You see, when light is present, darkness doesn't go away until light's present. When light is present, darkness begins to dispel. So many of us, we've worked so hard trying to wrangle and wrestle the darkness in our life. And Jesus is like, you don't have to do that. Just turn the light on. Just let the light in. Let him in and let him deal with the darkness. Let him deal with the pain. Let him deal with the disappointments. He is an ever-present and good God. And those same words he, he gave to Martha, I want you to ask yourself, Okay, he is resurrection. He is eternal life. Will I let him in? He says, do you believe this? He's asking you today, do you believe this? Do you believe I am who I say I am? Will you let me in? Will you begin a journey with me? Will you let me heal you? Who cares how crazy other people are? Who cares what's going on in other people who call themselves Christians? Just don't look at that. Look at me. Don't be distracted by messy people. Look at me. I'm a good God, and I love you, and I'm pursuing you. And even though your Saturday has been long, your night has been long, I am dawning a new day. I'm inviting you into a new day in your life where I bring hope and healing and encouragement and strength. Will you let me in? You know, for both Juma and Betty, they said yes to Jesus. It changed everything. They went on and, and truly led not only just, you know, all the other students, so they went on to Bible college. Their lives were transformed. They became these massive healing agents in their community, champions in their community. How often I wonder what God has for us, the kind of places of strength he's trying to lead us to. Right? God takes the abuse and he, he makes that your area of strength or all those things like God transforms and he resurrects if you'll let him in. And I want to say this, you know, if, if you've never done that, I want to give you an opportunity right now to say yes to Jesus. Say yes to Jesus. Just say, Jesus, I don't know, I understand it all, but I say yes. I want to let you in. In fact, let's pray right now. If you've never done that or maybe you have felt distant and disengaged or disappointed or whatever, I want you to, to take a moment right now and invite him into that place. Jesus, I pray for every person that's watching that, that needs to reconnect with you or needs to connect with you. Every person, God, that's been in a dark night, every person, Lord, that has been in a long Saturday, God, or a, what's felt like a lifetime of Fridays, Lord, I pray, God, that we would hear your words today, Lord, that you said to, to Martha, do you believe me? I am resurrection. Let me in. God, I pray 
for every person, that their heart would be open to truly receiving your love and your goodness in their life. And I want to encourage you right now just to agree with me in this prayer. Pray this out loud with me. Jesus, I give you my life. Jesus, I invite you in. I believe you are who you say you are. God, I give you my mess. I give you my disappointment. I give you all the questions. God, I need the dawn of a new day in my life. I need night to turn to day. Jesus, thank you for what you've done for me. I receive your forgiveness. It's free. I receive your forgiveness. Jesus, you say your eternal life. Well, I receive it. Thank you. Teach me. Help me. Be with me. Step into all my pain. Jesus, I invite you into every place. I make you the Lord of my life. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for raising from the dead for me. Thank you for pursuing me and choosing me. Thank you for saying yes to me when everybody else said no. Thank you, Jesus. I receive your love. Lead my life. And for maybe others who are watching, I want to encourage you. Wherever you're at in your journey, I want you to hear my words prophetically over you today. It is the dawn of of a new day in your life. It is the dawn of a new day in your life. Jesus is moving. It may have felt like a Saturday. There may be a lot of unanswered questions, but I'm telling you, the clock has, has struck midnight. We are now in AM. It is a new day. God is on the move. Expect miracles. Expect a resurrection. Expect the impossible becoming possible. Have faith. You're going to regret not having had faith because it's happening. Have faith. God is moving. God is doing powerful things. So we bless you. We speak life over you. We speak just the presence of God over you and your family as you celebrate and embrace that he is the resurrection. Well, family, a couple things I want to invite you to today, um, right after service, actually right now, if, if you want prayer for anything, we have an incredible team of people who are ready, standing by the phone, ready to pray with you. We want to pray for you. If you feel like you've been in a Saturday season, if you just, you know, said yes to Jesus for the first time, would you call the number um, that you'll see now in the, um, in the text thread below? Would you call that number and just tell somebody what you just did and let us pray with you, let us encourage you, let us strengthen you? Um, our team is available to pray with you. And then also right after service, as soon as we close here, we have a really special Easter side lawn um, time, which will start in a couple of minutes. And it's just a time to, to come and connect and for our team to get to know you and encourage you and for you to connect with others. And so we look forward to getting to, to celebrate with you. We love you and we are believing for the dawn of a new day in your life. Happy Easter. Hello everyone, happy Easter. My name is Karen Therese Law and I'm one of your hosts for Side Lawn and this is Sky Bear. He is my Easter buddy bunny for today. So we are here to invite you to come hang out with us at Side Lawn. If you don't know what Side Lawn is, it is a really fun place that we get together, talk about the sermon, have fun games, win prizes. I mean, who's gonna win a prize, right? So anyway, go and check out expression58.org backslash events to find the link. And remember, you have 15 minutes after service, so go ahead and grab your favorite coffee, tea, or entire Easter meal. Sky already ate his, so we will see you then. Okay, bye. Can you say bye, Sky?
crowd No city wall can't stand before us now Your people